。话说天下大事，分久必合，合久必分。It is said that under heaven, great powers, long divided, must unite. Long united, must divide. The Zhou Dynasty's end saw seven realms struggle for mastery, then merge into the Qin. Then the Qin ended afterwards, and the realms of Chu and Han struggled for mastery. Again, these merged into the Han. This dynasty had sat tall ever since Han Gaozu Huangdi won the war. Then divided into three realms, which struggled for mastery. Thus has it ever been. Yet the Han's end started not with Cao Pi deposing the Emperor Xian, nor did it start with Dong Zhuo marching into the imperial capital. Its roots lay not even in yellow-scarfed rebels or with eunuchs flattering the emperor, controlling him as a puppet. The Han's problems ran much deeper: the complex interplay of bureaucrats, taxation, peasantry, and landowners figured more into the Han's end. The eunuchs and warlords were only signs of a greater flood that finally broke when Dong Zhuo sent his armies to quench the fire over Luoyang. The Chinese character Guo is often translated and indeed used as state or country. This word comes from a storied start. In the time of Shang kings, people near the Yellow River lived in enclosed camps, some with walls, others only fences. Hence, we have our first character, Wei, meaning enclosure. These marked lands where a man, a family, or a whole people lived. Hence, our second character, Yu, meaning scope. These words' histories reflect wider changes in Chinese society, and how its people's worldview changed with their institutions. On the Song Mountains by the Central Yellow River Plain, seven cities rose as lowland realms fell into decline and collapse. These cities lay in the margins of richer, more powerful cultures that came from around Longshan. Cooling climate, however, brought their plenty to an end. Lowland elites claimed divine favor from ancestors and spirits. Floods and famines meant that these had withdrawn their favor, while on the margins the Song Highland cities traded with steppe dwellers and workers. These steppe people knew how to work bronze, how to farm millet and wheat, and how to herd and hunt. These innovations helped the Highland cities survive the collapse. Highland elites used their new prosperity to claim otherworldly favor as lowland realms saw their peoples move elsewhere. What we call the early two culture saw its subjects obey their rulers as they believed their signs and symbols. Early Tou chieftains forced people to settle in enclosed areas near capitals. Wise elders governed these enclosures for the chieftain. These had many titles: Hao or Archer Lords, Gong or Eel Doorman, Bow or Eldest Men, among others. Bronze vessels became marks of rulers' favors given to Eel Doorman and other elites for use in ritual feasts. Hunting became a favored pastime among rulers and their retinues, helping provide for their households while increasing cohesion and friendship. The chieftain or Wang built special walled palaces known as Wang Qing in their cities. At this point, Guo referred to the outer city surrounding the palace, where soldiers and nobles lived. Here we see the central Yellow River Valley's rise as quote a thin network of pathways and encampments along which the chieftain moved or sent his commands. A league of towns allied by kinship or shared religious practice, towns which were dispersed amidst alien and hostile settlements. End quote. The Shang Dynasty upheld these institutions after their takeover. Archaeological and documentary evidence show that the Shang forced people into colonies linked to capital cities. Bronze vessels spread as marks of dynastic favor. Hunts and feasts remained elite pastimes. 
The central Yellow River Valley saw a population boom and the Shang would spread out across it. Their power reached as far as east of the Taihang Mountains and west of the River Wei, with oracle bones listing the Shang King's levies from Eldorman in these lands. While the Shang chieftains boasted their power both through these signs and symbols and by military might, the Shang state at large was composed of such initially independent communities brought together into a loose federation by the hegemonic power of the Shang King. The geopolitical perimeter of the Shang state, if there was one, can indeed be very elusive, extending very far, as mentioned above, when a Shang King's power was prevailing, but more limited when a king's power diminished. These pro-Shang communities might have shared a common cultural background manifest in the archaeological entity usually called Shang culture, although communities that shared the Shang culture may not necessarily all have been parts of the Shang state. The political geography of the Shang state could change from time to time, depending on the actual power of the king and on the responses of the various local leaders to that power. There was no permanent membership in the Shang state as there was no permanent enemy of it. Exactly 750 of these communities existed by 1045 BC. Among these was the Zhou. Like other communities, the Zhou offered sacrifices to the Shang ancestors and in turn received bronze vessels among other signs of dynastic ascent. While a small community on the Shang's western edge, the Zhou managed to build an alliance with nearby communities and cities. This growing power took the Shang's attention and its forces promptly killed the Zhouish alderman Jili. Yet, in 1059 BC, the next Zhou elderman Wen saw a celestial alignment among five planets. Within 24 years, the Zhou had conquered the Shang. In 1038 BC, the second Zhou, dynastic chieftain Cheng, dedicated a ritual bronze vessel with this inscription. When King Wu conquered the great city Shang, he then made reverent declarations to heaven, saying, let me dwell in this, the central region, and from here govern the people. The Zhou dynasty thus had built itself firmly in Zhongguo, the central region, China. Throughout the next century, Zhou kings took rapid conquests out from the Yellow River Valley into the rest of China, north of the Great River. These conquests relied on close collaboration between royal Zhou forces and those of local communities. These new conquests saw colonization by migrants from Zhou or allied cities, bringing their ways to these new lands. While Shang hegemony kept local societal institutions intact, Zhou culture and customs spread to all the land. Local communities saw societal organization along Zhou lines, forming the first homogenous Chinese society. Zhou rule saw unprecedented scale in East Asia for its time institutional developments inevitably happened with the new reality. After putting down a rebellion by the defeated Shang people, the Zhou began the practice of having multiple capitals. The fabled city of Luoyang was built where the River Wise flows into the River Luo. More retainers entered royal service as clerks and administrators, helping manage large tracts of land under royal power. Soon enough, these clerks and retainers coalesced into formal branches of the Zhou administration. Heading the government was the ministry, which grew from multiple offices with interrelated roles. Collective management became important for these, leading to a central bureau that grew into the Zhou's most enduring administrative institution. This ministry developed the first standard protocols in Chinese and arguably East Asian administration. Routine maintenance of the ministry fell on clerks and officials who had the permanent task of handling daily affairs. Of course, as a Bronze Age government in China, the Western Zhou government certainly displays some characteristics that would set it apart from many contemporary governments in the world and from the bureaucratic state centralism of imperial China that emerged around the time of Qin unification. Defining these general operational habits can provide us with a new basis for understanding the nature and function of the Western Zhou government. Yet the Zhou ministry's development into a routine administrative institution represented Chinese society at work on a higher level of complexity than ever seen in East Asia. Specialized roles came with increased command and control over the Zhou lands. The ministry itself was an important development because it defined the role of the government 
and classified its functions according to actual administrative purposes and because it was a routine government bureau that was intended to manage affairs on a continuing and uninterrupted basis. Certainly, it was an important step towards the development of the impersonal role in the Joe government that is characteristic of all bureaucratic institutions. Joe claimed heaven's mandate as protecting its rule and thus needed more safeguards than the Shang before. Dynastic conquests thus relied not only on armies and stratagems, but on great commitment to civil administration. This secured logistics and internal security for the realm. Zhou administration gave it the needed advantage to defeat peripheral peoples. Here we see how a first increase in complexity allows society greater benefits than without it. While the king remained the highest ruler in the land, Zhou Ealdorman wielded the real power to stir the bureaucracy into movement. To give a salient example, Ealdorman Dan of Zhou headed the war against Shang remnants in rebellion, letting his dynasty remain in power for almost the next thousand years. These Ealdorman marked the early Zhou as a bureaucratic structure that was supervised through a family structure, much different from latter Chinese dynasties. At the start, the Zhou installed family members as Ealdorman over the rest of China. However, as time went on and more and more recent royal princes joined the rank of Ealdorman, the dominance of the Zhou and Shou lineages was naturally broken down, hence giving rise to a government that allowed competition for political power among the numerous lineages, as was probably the situation during the Midwestern Zhou. City-states under Zhou rule began with different ethnic groups practicing their own customs under a Zhou elite. Over time, however, ethnic lines blurred as these communities adopted Zhou institutions. Wealth and income became the main mark of elite status, with rich natives being seen as the same as Zhou overlords. Local elites had obligations not just to their subjects, but to the Zhou realm at large. Unlike the Shang, who shared power with local rulers who joined religious rituals and hunts, Zhou King saw local rulers as mere delegates. The latter had power only from the former. To the Zhou, local rulers were but subjects exercising the king's rule in his absence. Bronze inscriptions and administrative records celebrating military campaigns show commands from the royal court greeted with unconditional obedience on rulers' parts. Even 200 years into Zhou rule, royal power could still organize operations involving local communities far from capitals. Zhou power had reached a peak yet unmatched anywhere but in other complex societies to the far west. From this peak, however, stumbled down the Zhou. The royal court, so successful in past campaigns, never thought that its military might could be bested. Nomadic horse riders from the steppe killed this notion. When King Yu favoured a concubine over his wife, the king's archer, Lord Father-in-law Shen, made common cause with Quanrong steppe nomads. Their invasion went as far as the capital Hojing, killing the king and taking a ransom from the government to leave. Zhou's societal complexity accounted nothing for these unexpected disruptions and were left reeling on what to do. Like many other complex societies on the verge of collapse, local rulers and regimes had to pick up the pieces. One city-state, Qi, had much experience dealing with steppe nomads. The people of Qin themselves had nomadic roots, settling east of the Yellow River after submitting to the Zhou. Their allegiance to the Zhou would become so firm that they were tasked to expel steppe nomads from the Wei River Valley in 851 BC. This people became well known for their use of cavalry and Zhou armies and campaigns. This latest and boldest stepper nomad incursion saw Elderman Xiang of Qin lead the new King Ping to safety in Luoyang. In reward for his service, the city-state of Qin received full autonomy directly under royal supervision. Qin armies would then march against the nomads, capturing lands further west of the Zhou capital. For generations, the Qin would become known as Zhou's protectors against encroaching steppe nomads. They built long walls to protect the western frontier, and they learned more about nomad tactics to counteract them. They also integrated former steppe nomads into their society, bringing them into Zhou's culture and institutions. Truly, 
The Qin showed how local rulers could understand their subjects' situations better than a central regime far from any action. And of course, other city-states in Zhou noticed what had happened. The invasion had exposed stagnancy and rot in Zhou. The Qin had grasped autonomy that would blossom into full independence. These had the resources and manpower to contest the royal court's rule. Instead of offering sacrifices to the Zhou ancestors, their rulers now offered to their own ancestors. Instead of swearing kinship and loyalty to the royal court, these now swore covenants with local nobles and bureaucrats for backing. Smaller, less powerful city-states swore allegiance to these new players. The 750 city-states of early Zhou would consolidate into just a few, who all grew confident in claiming royal titles and prestige for themselves. What happened next was inevitable. Under heaven, as they say, great powers, long united, must divide. Just as the Zhou achieved military dominance through logistics and organization, so too with the Qin. Lord Shangyang set rules for how the Qin ealdorman needed to handle his own officials and delegates. To Lord Shang's school of methods, the ruler must set well-defined tasks for his delegates to carry out. Delegates who finish tasks gain rewards. Those who fail get punished. Beyond these, the ruler must never interfere with operations. He must never let his intentions be known. In his inaction, the ruler has gained mastery of his realm and of his government. Thus was how Keen worked late in the warring states against its foes. The elderman gave tasks to his commanders who passed or failed them. Those who failed were punished. Those who passed had learned from those who had failed. Commanders would do the same to their troops, ensuring that they followed orders without knowing what in the bigger picture these would lead to. The Qin worked on its own higher level of complexity to defeat its enemies. China would be united once more under its own banner, and its customs and methods would spread as the Zhou's did before. The last king of Qin, Ying Zheng, claimed a new title, Emperor. Under heaven, as they say, great powers, long divided, must unite. Qin administration, however, stagnated and decayed in turn, from unreasonable adherence to the letter of imperial tasks. Imperial officials kept sparking rebellions, for they would be punished for even the most sensible errors in carrying out tasks. Qin went from benefiting from complexity to suffering from its logical extreme, decay and rot seeping so much that no real stability ensued in the realm. After one last rebellion, China would once again split apart, now into 18 kingdoms. The Qin dynasty had lasted for no more than 15 years. From these 18 kingdoms rose China's golden age, when the Han ruled. Liu Bang, the Gaozu emperor, enacted five reforms doing away with Qin policies. Only three laws. Murderers sentenced to death, those who harm others or steal are punished. People would enjoy security as it was in the past. Qin's royal and imperial lands, gardens and parks, were opened up for people to cultivate. Land tax exemptions for those who aided the military with labor, with family members of soldiers exempt from both. Villages and towns would elect a man over 50, the San Leo, to teach imperial officials local conditions and advise them. However, the early Han saw holdover troubles plague local societies. During uprisings, the Qin Many landowners, local leaders, and former officials had left their homes to join campaigns. In doing so, those who did not join the fighting grabbed their lands. The Han gave these no formal titles or ranks, unlike those who had owned the land before. However, land grabbing in wake of the uprising allowed these to control more than 60% of all fertile land. Despite entreaties by those who had lost lands, Imperial officials did nothing to solve their concerns. Inaction on this problem concerned even the emperor himself, who wrote in an edict that, among members of the former noble houses and those who have returned from the army, there are very many with high noble ranks. I have several times ordered imperial officials to give fields and habitations to them first. Some of the former nobles and holder of ranks have been rulers of their people, have been respected and honored by the emperor, and have been established for a long time. 
yet concerning their need for land to resettle the imperial officials have not taken action. This is utterly incomprehensible. Moreover, according to law, those who rendered meritorious service should be given land and habitations. Yet at present, many of the magnates who had never served in the army have satisfied themselves in land grab, while on the other hand, those who have rendered meritorious service have received nothing. This is in violation of the public interest for the interest of private individuals. These magnates who enriched themselves during the uprising convinced imperial officials to let them retain their holdings, whether through corruption or control. This new, stronger class of landlords went on to dominate Han society. Local leaders and court officials warned the imperial court against interfering too much in the problem. Memories of the Qin's excessive control of even the smallest details still held in their minds. Lord Shang Yang's school of methods prevailed, and the imperial court kept to inaction. Thus, 40-50% to 50 of the population became tenants, and the remaining freeholders made do with less than 40% of fertile land. Later imperial policies only worsened the land crisis. Land taxes were reduced, adding to the land grabber's wealth. Aristocratic ranks and bureaucratic titles were sold to the highest bidder, granting the descendants of land grabbers tacit imperial recognition. When Emperor Wu attempted economic reforms to centralize Han society, his introduction of a methodized Confucian philosophy only added to the problems. Merchantry under the four occupations became work of low prestige, forcing merchants to invest in lands. While their prestige was salvaged, the land-grabbing problem only worsened. Civil service recommendations recruited the rich and powerful who could afford a Confucian education. Having bureaucratic backing in turn meant that these rich and powerful could gain more riches and power. The new imperial Confucianism saw no problem here as long as local elites paid lip service to Confucius. Imperial policies, in fact, encouraged harmony and solidarity between tenants and local elites. The most successful outcome of imperial Confucianism was building ties of kinship and local solidarity on the local level. Paradoxically, while Emperor Wu's reforms meant to strengthen imperial power, they only planted the seeds of its own downfall. Even in the heyday of Han rule, the subcurrent of particularist local traditions and regional interests had persisted beneath the formidable facade of imperial unity erected and maintained by the Han rulers and their bureaucracy. Waves of strong reaction, coming mainly from the local magnates and the large and powerful clans with special landed interests in the provinces, had obstructed many reform attempts. These same forces had exploded into open rebellion when Wang Mang usurped the throne of the last ruler of the former Han and initiated a drastic political and economic reform. The usurper, Wang Mang, had been a Confucian scholar and bureaucrat who served as regent to the Han. His control of the imperial court emboldened him to take the throne and declare himself emperor. He would, however, meet his end after only a few years when the old capital Chang'an fell to rebel forces. Liu Xiong, the new emperor, moved the capital back to the Zhou city of Luoyang. The emperor had persuaded warlords and local elites into helping the Liu family reclaim imperial throne. His reliance on these warlords and local elites, however, set the stage for the restored Han dynasty situation in its last few hundred years. The restored dynasty ruled 4 million square kilometers and 50 million people. An empire this large needed competent bureaucrats with high learning and literacy. Commissioned officials alone numbered 7,000, with 140,000 more lesser officials. While only a small number compared to the larger population, the bureaucracy fared well in administration, especially when backed by military force. Agriculture was an especially important source of imperial revenue. Arable land counted 300,000 square kilometers, and most subjects lived in subsistence farms. The Han, however, cared not for yields or misfortunes befalling landholders. As Joseph Tainter says, complexity simplifies. The imperial bureaucracy levied taxes on land size and land size alone. Smallholders could get wiped out by taxes after a bad harvest. Forced labor and conscription took further profits and income from them. 
These policies in a peasant-based subsistence economy forced many to seek protection from great landowners. These great landowners owned most arable land, their wealth having helped the Han reclaim the throne. Their holdings would only increase over the next century. They could shoulder crop failures from simply having more harvests. They could gather cash reserves to pay both their and others' taxes. Their tenants received protection against imperial taxation and forced labor. These same tenants in turn helped their lords gain more wealth through services. More farmers sought the great landowner's sway as imperial administration fell heavy on simple people. In the restored Han dynasty, however, imperial officials needed the backing of community leaders. In a peasant-based subsistence economy, these leaders were the great landowners. One development during the whole of Chinese history that is now increasingly clear is the slow political absorption of the landed aristocracy in the imperial state, which carries on across dynastic boundaries and times of trouble, independent of the expansion and contraction of aristocratic landowning in general. The aristocracy were older than the unified state, and the Han recognized the independent powers at least of the greatest aristocratic clans of the north. Such independence was certainly in part an ideological feature, in that such aristocrats did not depend on state office holding for their self-definition. But we have reference to the effective political control they had locally as well. While the restored Han would leave the landowners alone, imperial policies made reforms in other directions. Wang Mang had usurped the throne with help from the bureaucracy and a growing Confucian scholar elite. Their power waned, with the imperial court transferring all power from certain offices in the ministry towards lesser officials. Fewer officials were allowed to meet with the emperor or even with his court. The imperial court itself had been reorganized to include only eunuch bureaucrats. While the emperor's power waxed from these changes, they also produced ill effects. The emperor's relatives by marriage came to hate him. The eunuch court became institutional enemies of court officials. The imperial bureaucracy splintered into competing factions. All these led to the imperial court having complete control over administration, yet the administration having little control over the local level. Part of this was intentional. Under the pressure of resurgent localism, the later Han court adopted an attitude of compromise and retrenchment. The court's modest attempt at registering the local population and the land holdings in AD 39 provoked widespread unrest in the provinces and the attempt had to be abandoned. Thenceforward, the court cautiously avoided any drastic measures which might upset the local equilibrium. Intrigue in the imperial government also made the imperial court detached from events on the ground. Imperial decrees were treated as wall decor, being too strange to actual situations on the local level. Local imperial officials from the capital saw their roles actually performed more and more by the San Leo and other locally recruited assistants. Many of these same local imperial officials would go native. They started identifying with their locales more than the imperial government as the latter's intrigue alienated them. The central government's incompetence was finally exposed in AD 153. The Yellow River flooded, destroying crops across the North China Plain. Locusts dealt with those which had lived through the flood. By this time, the imperial treasury had already gone empty. The past 50 years had seen ambitious campaigns against Xiongnu, steppe nomads, war against Chang rebels, among many other wars that had drained imperial coffers. All while these troubles persisted, intrigue flared in the imperial court as Grand War Minister Liang Ji the Jingzong Emperor's brother by marriage sought to control the Emperor and whom could speak with him. The Imperial Court lay paralyzed as troubles afflicted the realm. In such restricted circumstances, the Imperial Court was no longer able to provide effective aid to any community in trouble. The autumn of 153 saw locusts in 32 commanderies and massive flooding on the Yellow River, with greatest effect upon Ji province. As homeless, hungry and destitute people wandered the roads to seek support, their numbers were estimated in the tens of thousands. Though an edict ordered local authorities to care for them and seek to resettle them, no extra funds were provided. Further flooding, locusts and crop failures were recorded in the two following years. 
and it was claimed that people in Ji province and even in the region of the capital were turning to cannibalism. Perhaps a cliché, but nonetheless a sign that the situation was serious. The government ordered turnips planted as food for the people, a drastic step for a society whose staple was wheat or millet, and officials were authorised to levy 30% of private grain stores. Ordinary people were to be paid in cash, kings and marquises might be recompensed from future tax. Clearly, the imperial granaries could not provide sufficient food in such a time of misfortune. Equally clearly, while there were considerable supplies in private hands, there was a limit to how much could be requisitioned, even in emergency. The central government's lack of care for provincial matters grew so large that the matter disaffected even the Confucian scholar elite. This class had begun with Emperor Wu and grew strong enough that Wang Mang had usurped the throne. Many Confucians had lamented his downfall, while the restored Hun would go on to expand Confucian education and the civil service system, the quality of Confucian teachings had only waned. The Imperial Academy in Luoyang would grow to 30,000 scholars and students, yet it would lose its best men out of dissatisfaction with the Academy's curricula. As the Imperial government lost more touch with the outside world, the Confucian scholar elite slowly lost focus on public order, government service and civic excellence. Personal relationships, family ties and individual interest and excellence became more popular topis. Instead of Emperor Wu's wish for a centralised empire, the Confucian scholar elite now turned on their old mission and they now wrote and spoke more against the imperial court's corruption. The struggle between court eunuchs and Confucians in the bureaucracy reached its peak when the former ordered many of the latter banished to their hometowns. Many more Confucians resigned their posts and headed back to the countryside. These scholars, who had gained skills and experience from their time in the capital, proved useful to local elites. The provinces became hotbeds for unrest and agitation against the central government. The new Confucian Morris, emphasizing family and local matters, approved of clan feuds and vendettas. Small-scale wars became common in the second century. Those who led bands in such campaigns gained prestige and popularity in their towns and villages. Confucian filial piety was more than enough rationale to let these incidents happen, as these few examples show. Aggressive by nature, Jia Xu of Taiwan was disliked and feared by his neighbors, and about 160 he killed a man to avenge his uncle. He was arrested and condemned to death, but the celebrated moralist Guo Tai interceded for him. Jia Xu was released her and later abandoned his violent ways. The father of Yu Wei Gao was killed in a vendetta, but before he could take revenge, he became mortally ill. His friend He Yong of Nanyang, however, carried out the reciprocal murder and brought his enemy's head to the Yu family tomb. He Yong attended the university at Luoyang, was known for his ability to judge character, and was friendly with the student leader Guo Tai and with the senior officials Chen Fan and Li Ying. Most celebrated, however, was Su Buwei of Yufufeng, who avenged the death of his father at the hands of the director of retainers Li Gao. Li Gao later became minister of finance, but Su Buwei and some friends tunneled into his residence and killed his concubine and his infant son. Su Buwei then dug up the body of Li Gao's father, took the head and presented it at the tomb of his own parent. When Li Gao died of an apoplexy, vengeance was complete. Later, however, the former frontier general Duan Jiong became director of retainers, and he had Su Bui and 60 of his followers arrested and killed. All these finally piled over each other into rebellions. In the 120s, a plague ravaged the empire. No mortal means seemed able to stop it as thousands died. Healers and doctors turned increasingly to supernatural means for a cure. Many, of course, peddled sham practices that cure no sicknesses. Others, however, sought for one last change in the mandate of heaven. Three brothers from Yu province proclaimed a prophecy throughout northern China. The blue sky is dead, and the yellow sky shall take its place. Their followers grew by the thousands. Local imperial officials first saw their teachings as a way to instill good conduct within the empire's subjects. As their followers kept growing, however, 
fears spread that this new host of yellow scarves could rival imperial power. As early as 177, imperial memos warned local officials to contain the yellow scarves so that imperial soldiers could deal with them just in case. As late as 183, imperial bureaucrats complained how local officials refused to do anything about the yellow scarves' growing strength. Thus, when the new year came, yellow lightning stormed through northern China. While the most well-known of rebels in the late Han, the yellow scarves were neither the only nor the most destructive ones. The yellow scarf rebellion, as large and fearsome as it was, was quickly pacified, but a few months after it had begun. Soldiers mopping up after them, however, found unusual items. Letters revealed that many of the court eunuchs had been in contact with the yellow scarves. The Emperor Ling burst into anger against the eunuchs, who had been his longtime mentors and guardians. You always told me how my officials were plotting rebellion, and you had me prescribe them from office and have some of them executed. But now it appears that they are the true servants of the state, while you people followed Zhang Jue. Why shouldn't I have you killed? The imperial court grappled with more tensions and intrigue as more rebellions sparked on the empire's peripheries. The worst of these happened in Liang province. Mere months after the yellow scarves were pacified, frontier peoples rose in rebellion. The empire lost its entire northwest frontier, cutting off access to Central Asia and lucrative trade routes. All in all, rebellions and unrest drained the already poor imperial treasury even more to supply and maintain armies. Harvests also failed as farmers went from their crops to join the army or the rebels. The Emperor Ling died in AD 189. There was no heir. As the empire lay bleeding and hapless, the eunuchs and imperial officials immediately fought each other over whom should take the throne. The capital was in chaos, the empire's protectors now protecting only their own riches and strength. A frontier officer, Dong Zhuo, was known to be physically strong. As a young man, he was once visited by steppe nomad elites in his home. To make a feast for them, Dong Zhuo killed the ox that he used for farming. The steppe nomads loved his generosity so much that they granted him a thousand head of cattle. Dong Zhuo had learned from them how to ride a horse and how to shoot his bow from horseback. He would use these skills to good use when he helped pacify banditry in his home province. Like other army officers of the time, Dong Zhuo had focused on gaining his men's loyalty and allegiance. Like with many others in the late dynasty, soldiers identified more and more with their commanders rather than with the emperor or the empire at large. Soldiers especially had no other place to turn to, for they were often so-called barbarians, convicts or veterans. Their families lay in the frontier and their lives went around their craft of war. Now, as the capital became bloodied in factional infighting, Dong Zhuo mustered his loyal warband and they made for Luoyang, over hills due west of the city, they could see a bright glow over the horizon. There was fire over Luoyang. Flames consumed the city that had hosted emperors and the court for more than a thousand years. The rest is history. Dong Zhuo's forces sacked the capital. Dong Zhuo himself gained control of the imperial government. A coalition of warlords formed to oppose the so-called tyrant, a coalition which had never formed in the empire's past troubles, but now waged war against a frontier provincial from the far west. These warlords had similar stories to Dong Zhuo. They each had become army officers and commanders. Their soldiers had grown more loyal to them over the empire or the emperor. And now, these warlords bore their soldiers against each other as the Han dynasty fell apart. China would split into three warring kingdoms, then into many more, as for the first time the land lay divided without a single ruler even in name only, for hundreds of years. As it is said, under heaven, great powers long divided must unite, long united must divide. Thus has it ever been.